Bible this morning, please, to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13. And we'll begin in verse 1. Romans chapter 13. Begin in verse 1. And I want to say thank you to Tom. A little under the weather. And, uh, it's good to know I have someone that can step in for me uh, when those occasions uh, present themselves. Romans chapter 13, beginning in verse 1. Let everyone submit to the governing authorities, since there is no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are instituted by God. So then the one who resists the authority is opposing God's command. Those who oppose it will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have its approval. For it is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, because it does not carry the sword for no reason. For it is God's servant, an avenger that brings wrath on the one who does wrong. Therefore you must submit not only because of wrath, but also because of your conscience. And for this reason you pay taxes, since the authorities are God's servants continually attending to these tasks. Pay your obligations to everyone. Taxes to those who owe taxes, tolls to those you owe tolls, respect to those you owe respect, and honor to those you owe honor. Father, as we study your word this morning, I ask you to use it to remind us of your plan and your program, to remind us how blessed we are, to remind us of our responsibilities and obligations as citizens, not only of your kingdom, but of this nation as well. Holy Spirit, work in our midst this morning, grant us understanding Convict where that is necessary and encourage where that is also. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people say. Amen. Amen. This coming week we will be celebrating the birthday of our country. I guess because of that and because of recent issues across our country, I have received two articles recently that I strongly disagree with. The first was talking about how upsetting patriotic services were for some when they were held in the church. The second discussed how the writer thought it was wrong to have a United States flag in a church building. I, on the other hand, have no problem with patriotic services, nor do I have a problem with flags in the church. The reason I have no issue with those items is because I believe America is a product of the mind of God. Daniel chapter 4 verse 17 we read this word is by decree of the observers the matter is a command from the holy ones. This is so the living will know that the most high is ruler over the kingdom of men. He gives it to anyone he wants and sets over it the lowliest of men. I have no problem with the flag because God is the one who dreamt up this nation. This nation was discovered, founded, and populated by Christians, not by merely religious folks. They were not Muslims, Buddhists, Mormons, or anything else that founded this nation. It was God-fearing, Bible-believing, Christ-loving, church-attending, Jesus-serving Christians that founded, designed, and built this nation. Second, God is the one who protects this nation. We have soldiers and sailors all around the world working to protect our nation. And I am grateful for all of them. I come from a family where many generations of our men have served in the military, have stepped up and defended this nation when called upon to do so. But let me tell you, unless God continues to protect this country, all the rest is done in vain. Psalm 127, verse 1, we read, Unless the Lord builds a house, its builders labor over it in vain. Unless the Lord watches over a city, the watchman stays alert in vain. 
I have no problem with the flag because God is the one who dreamt up this nation. I have no problem with the flag because God is the one who protects this nation. And third, I have no problem with the flag because God is the one who blessed this nation. In spite of the COVID outbreak recently, our nation enjoys still one of the lowest unemployment rates in the world, less than half of that of many other countries. The cost of medical care in our country is high and continues to rise, and yet we still enjoy some of the best health care in the world. And our pharmaceutical companies were staffed by some of the world's brightest minds. There would be no debate about drugs from Canada if those inventing new drugs in this country were not producing drugs wanted by others around the world and exporting them in the first place. We enjoy a standard of living most in the world can only dream of. With many who are considered poor in our country, still enjoying TV sets, cell phones, automobiles, air conditioning, items only the wealthy enjoy in many countries. While some countries struggle just to grow enough food to feed their people, our nation's farmers use countless thousands of farming acres to grow sod and ornamentals to decorate our yards. They export billions of dollars worth of agricultural goods and still our citizens struggle with obesity. We truly live in a God-blessed nation. This morning I would like you to notice with me the two ingredients required for living in a God-blessed nation. Romans chapter 13, beginning in verse 1, let's read it there together again. Let everyone submit to the governing authority since there is no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are instituted by God. So then the one who resists the authority is opposing God's command, and those who oppose it will bring judgment on themselves. The rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have its approval. For it is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, because it does not carry the sword for no reason. For it is God's servant and avenger that brings wrath on the one who does wrong. Therefore you must submit not only because of wrath, but also because of your conscience. And for this reason you pay taxes, since the authorities are God's servants continually attending to these tasks. Pay your obligations to everyone, taxes to those you owe taxes, tolls to those you owe tolls, respect to those you owe respect, and honor to those you owe honor. Paul tells us in the beginning verses of this passage that all government is established and ordained by God. God is so concerned for us that he established government authorities to help our society operate according to his plans. Society would be spoiled. Our nation would never flourish if every man were allowed to do what was right in his own eyes. So God established government to punish evildoers and to reward those who do right. Evidently, our founding fathers understood that, for they wrote in the preamble to our Constitution that they were forming a new government to establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. Let me tell you, my friends, the movement sweeping our nation nowadays to defund the police it's not a movement against racism. It is a movement against God. It is a an attack upon an institution that God has established to protect and reward His people. My friend, that's why our government was established. And that's the way God intended it. But there are two essential requirements in a God-blessed nation. First, we must have godly leaders. And godly leaders walk with God. Save your places and turn with me, please, to Proverbs chapter 8. Proverbs chapter 8 and verse 12. Proverbs chapter 8, beginning in verse 12. I, wisdom, share a home with shrewdness and have knowledge and discretion. To fear the Lord is to hate evil. I hate arrogant pride, evil conduct, and perverse speech. I possess good advice and sound wisdom. I have understanding and strength. It is by me that kings reign and rulers and act just law. 
By me, princes lead as the nobles and all righteous judges. I love those who love me, and those who search for me will find me. Under, evil men do not understand justice, but those who seek the Lord understand all things. My friends, godly leaders must walk with God. They must have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, for the first century and a half of our nation, it was a requirement in most of the states of our country that in order to serve as an elected official, you must be a Christian and be involved in a local church. It was only in the middle of the last century that those laws were done away with in many of our states. Because the founders of our nation and the builders of our states understood that in order to have a godly nation, we must have God-fearing leaders. The Bible tells us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And if we are to have a just and a righteous and a growing nation, it must be led by people who have godly wisdom, who have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. To have godly leaders, they must have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and walk with Him faithfully. For these verses tell us that only those who seek the Lord understand. They are the only ones who judge with wisdom. It is all I can do to make the necessary decisions for my family. To make the decisions which chart the course of a nation and which lead it in the right direction requires the wisdom of God. Godly leaders must walk with God. Jesus said in John chapter 15 and verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. Funny how quickly we forget that. A godly leader walks with God. And second, a godly leader defends the weak. Proverbs chapter 31, if you look there with me please. Proverbs chapter 31, beginning of verse 8. Proverbs chapter 31, beginning of verse 8. Speak up for those who have no voice, for the justice of all who are dispossessed. Speak up, judge righteously, and defend the cause of the oppressed and needy. The Bible views the unborn child as a human person which should be protected. In Psalm 139, verse 13, we read, For you created my innermost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. In Luke chapter 1, verse 44, we read, As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leapt for joy. John the Baptist, while still and a, a baby in his mother's womb heard the coming of Mary, understood she was carrying the Christ child, and leapt for joy in his mother's womb. Because an unborn child is still a child created in the image of God. A godly leader assumes the responsibility of protecting those unable to protect themselves, and of appointing judges to do the same. And there are none more helpless None more defenseless than our unborn children. Exodus chapter 21, beginning of verse 22, we read, And if men struggle with each other and strike a woman with child so she has a miscarriage, yet there is no further injury, he shall surely be fine as the father's husband shall demand of him, and he shall pay as the judges decide. They understood, even back then, that an unborn child was valuable and precious in the sight of God. And that leads to a, the third responsibility of a godly leader. A godly leader rules righteously regardless. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 10, we read, A divine decision is in the lips of the king. His mouth should not err in judgment. A godly leader is going to do what he knows what is right. He is going to do what his heart and his Lord lead him to do. Regardless of what is popular or socially acceptable, at the time, as Harry S. Truman once said, I wonder where the Israelites would be if Moses had taken a pole before they crossed the Red Sea. A godly leader walks with God. A godly leader defends the weak. A godly leader leads righteously regardless. But my friends, in a God-blessed nation, there must not only be godly leaders, but there must also be godly 
citizens. Just as a building is no better than the materials you constructed with, a nation is no better than the citizens that make it up. If a nation is to be blessed by God, then it must have godly citizens. Look with me again there, if you would, please, Romans chapter 13 and verse 1. Let everyone submit to the governing authorities, since there is no authority except from God. Godly citizen is an obedient person. Verse 1 says the people are to be in subjection to the governing authorities. In other words, they are to be obedient people. In the book of Judges, when we see the nation of Israel slowly falling apart, we repeatedly read, and every man did what was right in his own eyes. Not so in a nation that wants to continue to be blessed by God. In such a nation, the citizens obey the governing authorities as long as those authorities haven't become so corrupt and twisted that they're commanding things against God's commands. You and I do not have the option of picking and choosing the laws we are to obey. We do not have the option of whether or not to pay taxes that the government requires. That is not up to you. God says, do it. And if you and I want this nation to continue to be blessed by God, then we must obey those laws. Think how much less stress and how much more peace there would be in your life. If you never had to worry about blue lights in your rearview mirror. And if you never had to worry about being audited. Look there again, if you will, please, in verse 3. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Do you want to be unafraid of the authorities? Do what is good, and you will have approval. Godly citizens are obedient people. Godly citizens are also involved people. Save your place and turn with me, please, to the book of Leviticus. Way back in the beginning of your Bible. Leviticus, right before the book of Numbers. Leviticus chapter 5. Leviticus chapter 5 and verse 1. When someone sins in any of these ways, if he has seen, heard, or known about something he has witnessed, and did not respond to a public call to testify, he will bear his iniquity. Did you see that? The Bible commands us to be witnesses, to testify to what we see. It burns my britches when I hear people talk about our society, about our nation going to heck in the hand basket, when they are unwilling to get involved themselves. They often point fingers and blame others. They blame our government for not making right laws. They blame law enforcement personnel for not catching the bad guys. And then when the bad guys are caught, they get kicked because some jury lets them off. Well, of course they do when the godly citizens make excuses and give reasons why they can't serve jury duty. My friend, law enforcement can get some people off the streets for a while, but they cannot change people's lives. Jesus is the only one who can do that, and you and I are charged as his ambassadors to share the gospel, the good news, to spread the light. My friends, when Jesus changed you and me, and when he charged you and I to be the light of the world, he didn't mean that we were to spend our time trying to get street lights. He meant that you and I are to carry the light of Jesus Christ to the streets. You want to do something about crime in our community? Then get involved. If Jesus Christ can raise the dead, and by the way he can, he has, and he will again. If he can give sight to the blind, if he can change a Christ-hating man like Saul into a Jesus-loving preacher like Paul, then he can change a drug dealer into a Lord lover. He can change a wife beater and child abuser into a loving husband and father. He can change a prostitute into a prayer warrior. You want to change this community? You want to change our nation and hit the streets? Take the gospel of Jesus Christ to the community. You want to do something about juvenile crime in our country? You want to do something about our kids failing in or dropping out of school? Then find some children and get involved. 
in the first century when Christians had no authority, no influence, no power in the government at all. The people in the community complained these Christians were turning the world upside down because they were loving on people and sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And by God, I want to see it again. Godly citizens are obedient people. Godly citizens are involved people. And third, godly citizens are decisive people. In Joshua chapter 24, verse 15, the nation of Israel had reached a crossroads. And Joshua made a decision. He took a stand and he made a statement. He said, y'all do what you want. To see y'all, you got to get back to the King James. He said, y'all do what you want. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. My friend, if this nation is going to continue to be a God-blessed nation, then it must have in it people who know what's right, who stand for what's right, regardless of what's popular or profitable at the time. You know, there's very little difference between the people sitting in the average church and the people in the world. We often dress the same, watch the same shows, read the same books and magazines, and live the same lives as people who don't claim to know Jesus Christ. We get distracted by the lust of the eye. We buy the biggest TVs, the newest cars, the trendy clothes, and sell our souls to MasterCard, just like they do high time you and I begin practicing what we preach and living like we believe what we claim to believe. That it is a relationship with Jesus Christ that brings contentment and joy to life and not our toys. Oh my friend, that point of order will only leave you frustrated. The bigger house only brings bigger bills. It's time we quit playing around and compromising. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Godly people are decisive people. They take a stand for what is right, and they live differently than the world. And lastly, godly people are selfless people. Look with me, please, in Matthew chapter 22, verse 36. Matthew chapter 22 and verse 36. Teacher, which command in the law is the greatest? He said to them, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and most important command. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets depend on these two commands. Godly citizens are giving people. They are caring people. They are concerned about others. My friend, when this nation was started, our founding father said the only way we could survive would be if we were a Christian nation. Why? Because if we were not a Christian nation, then we would vote ourselves everything. And we have seen that taking place in our country for years. Where more and more people vote to take from those who have and have built so those who have not labored can have it. In this upcoming election, what are many people voting about? They will vote for the people who promised them the most. It doesn't matter what it does to other people. It doesn't matter how it impacts our children or our seniors or generations to come or anything else. Just tell me what's in it for me. It was a little over 40 years ago that President Kennedy said, Ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. My, how things have changed. A marriage made up of two selfish people is like a household from hell. A businessman like some we've seen in the last few years that thinks only of making money is a scourge to us all. 
and a nation made up of selfish people will never be blessed by God. My friends, we must pray like we believe God still answers. We must go like we believe that God will still use us. We must live like we know people will watch us. We must love like Jesus showed us. And we must hope like our nation depends on us. We can't leave today, however, without looking at the good news. Our nation is going through a recession hard time. People have lost their jobs. Parents have lost children to the world. Our country has lost some of its power and prestige and influence that it has enjoyed in the past. We have lost our citizens to terrorists, our savings to shutdowns, our neighbors to disease, and our sons to war. But it does not have to be that way. We can see God's favor shine on our land once again. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, the Lord made a promise. He said, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, and seek my face and turn from the wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. I want you to notice in this passage that our Lord says His blessing is in the hands of His people. It is not the rioters or the looters or the arsonists in whose hands the fate of our nation rests. The fate of our nation rests in the hands of God's people and the Christians of our nation. For it is only Christians, those sitting in the church today, those who are called by His name, that can cause His blessings to return once again. We do that by humility. We realize that it is not our efforts or the efforts of our forefathers that have built this nation, but rather it is the blessings of God. If this nation is going to be turned around, it's going to be turned around through humility. And it's going to be turned around through prayer. No great spiritual revival in the history of the world has ever taken place or been recorded as taking place without prayer preceding that revival. People pray that God will turn the hearts of the people and of the nation back to Him once again. We want to see our nation turned around. We must humbly approach, realizing that it is God's hand. We must approach Him in prayer, asking Him to do a miracle, do a work where we cannot. We must seek the Lord. We make seeking God a priority in our lives with our time and our efforts. We make determining His will in a situation instead of our preferences a priority. We ask, Lord, what would you have me do in this situation? forth we repent. Turning from our backslidden, disobedient ways. We get the things out of our lives we know that displease Him. And then we have a promise. I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sins. 